Okay, here we go. I'm back with my old cover band again, and this is one of my favorites. But I can't sing quite as high as I used to. I wonder if they can take it down a whole step to G. That's much better. That's transposition. This is Music Student 101, and now your hosts, Jeremy Burns and Matthew Scott Phillips. Oh yeah. How did you like that intro music? That was nice. That was nice. I call that Tuesdays Here. Tuesday is here. It is very closely related to a Leonard Skinner song some of you guys may be familiar with. And transposed down a whole step. For the comfort of the singer, <laughs> our announcer Mike Cunliffe in this case. <laughs> this is something that actually both the books that I'm studying from for these little you know podcasts, uh, Harmony and, oh, I'm sorry, Tonal Harmony. Mm-hmm. And, um, and. Uh, harmony and context. Harmony and context. Right, yeah. Right. Uh, neither of these had a chapter on transposition that I that I saw. Yeah. One had like an appendix in the back of the book. Right, yeah. But um, it's something that I think most musicians need to uh, know earlier Un- on. Yeah, understand. And most musicians need to understand some, some form of it. Uh-huh. Uh, transposition is one of those things that there's a lot of sort of – there's a lot of ideas under that one big umbrella of, mm. of transposition. And I guess it's considered – uh, to be either an orchestral technique or um, an instrumental technique, mm-hmm. you know, not not necessarily a harmonic technique, which is probably why it's not mentioned in a lot of textbooks ah. at, at at that level. But it's still very very important. So you know, it's, it's definitely something we need to talk about. How would you define transposition? I know there's two main kinds, but we're going to stick on on one for right now and go into the other later on. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but we can define them both now, I guess. You want to. It doesn't matter. Let's just do one at a time. Okay. So in general, the act of transposition is uh, the act of moving music by a certain distance up or down. Using moving all of the notes uh, up or down by a certain distance for some reason. Mm-hmm. That is about as general as uh, is is I can I can get. So chromatic transposition is the act of moving everything up by a certain interval, basically. So if I am playing a nice little melody here in C major, but for whatever reason I don't want to be playing that melody in C major, let's say I wanted to be uh, uh, playing that melody up a minor third from that, Mm. You know, I would transpose it up a minor third by moving every one of those notes uh, up a minor third. You know. So if I if I if I heard the first one, mm. and then somebody threw a whole bunch of pink noise or, or distractions <laughs> or a, a symphony <laughs> or something like that in my head, and then I heard it again. I might think that was the exact same thing. Yeah, well, uh, intervallically it is. So the relationships between the notes that you're hearing are all still still there. Mm-hmm. You know, we've just we've just moved everything up a, a certain distance. And so instead of playing it uh, in C major or whatever I did, I, don't, mm-hmm. I, don't, I already forgot. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we've just moved it up a minor <coughs> third. So now we're playing it in E flat major. So every one of those notes got moved up a minor third. Perfect. So it maintains the harmonic and melodic structure with uh, precision. Absolutely. Uh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Cool. So uh, I know some reasons why I would transpose. <laughs> um, this has come up many times. The one most obvious thing I can think of is when you got a band together mm-hmm. and you're doing something in a key and the key that the original artist did it in or whatever you found on the Google <laughs> might not be the key that your singer can sing it in. Right. Like a, as in it, uh, addressed by our uh, intro music example. Yes, indeed. Voices tend to be an instrument that 
you know, it is some keys are more comfortable than others for certain singers. And uh, yeah, one of the most common ideas, especially in, in commercial and popular music, is to transpose for the sake of getting it into a key that your singer can sing. And you can transpose up or transpose down, you know, just to make it more comfortable for them. Yeah. Is one good reason. As, um, it's my understanding that a lot of uh, touring musicians, they might have recorded something in a certain key, mm -hmm. but because they do it over and over on the road, they might have been given their best in the studio, but they can't sing that high note every time. Yeah. So they get the whole band to bring everything down maybe a step right, or so. Right, yeah. Age can affect that too. Some of these uh, some of these guys that could sing, you know, super high ear-splittingly back when they were in their 20s and 30s, Yeah. you know, not so much now. So, you know, maybe play it play it down from where we did to, yeah. to, uh, uh, to help them out. So that, that's one reason. Uh, similarly, if you happen to be playing in a group that has a non-chromatic instrument, like a set of bagpipes mm -hmm. or a penny whistle or yeah. something like that, yeah, um, you know, these are instruments that can only play in one, maybe two keys. Mm -hmm. So you have to transpose to the key that they can play in for them to be able to play with you. Right. Yeah. A prime example is my Irish band, Jasper Cole. Uh, we have a bagpipe player, Ryan Morrison. And his bagpipes are tuned in A mixolydian. And even though they're MIDI bagpipes, so we can get A440 mixolydian, <laughs> yeah. it's still um, it's still a fairly restricted instrument. Yeah. Uh, so we find ourselves playing songs limited to the keys of A major and B minor. Right. Because they fit within that kind of scale. Yep. Or yep. somewhat. Yep. And then we have a whistle player. Our lead singer, Matt Parrish, plays the whistles. So he's got like a little kind of grab bag of whistles to grab from. Sure. So when we're yeah. doing our stuff in A minor, he'll bust out the C whistle. Right, yeah. Uh, and vice versa, a B minor, he'll bust out D whistle. Right, And of yeah. course, because our fiddle player, my man Kevin Nicholson, is really, a fiddle seems to be very comfortable in D and A. Oh, sure. So we find ourselves doing a lot of stuff in D, A, <laughs> E minor, uh, because, you know, in a D-friendly instrument, there'll be a lot of melodies in E Dorian uh, based on scale degree two, or A mixolydian based on scale degree five, you know, um... Things like that. Yeah, DNA or open strings on the fiddle. Open strings, yeah. yeah, so they can lead to that really, um, yep. yeah, more open strings you have, I think, the better. Yeah, Maybe. right. For, for stringed instruments. But then, of course, you know, um, I've heard uh, pianists say they prefer they can prefer flat keys sometimes, like E flat and B flat. Is that just because they fall more comfortably under their fingers? I suppose so. Maybe so, because... Yeah. Yeah. So other ways that we do this, uh, I guess the, the shortcut to transposition for stringed instruments, such as the guitar or mandolin, banjo, people put capos on their instruments. Absolutely, So the yeah. capo actually clamps down on whatever fret you put it on and changes the scale of the instrument to suit that. Right, and the end, of, the end effect of, of adding a capo to your guitar is you're gonna transpose something to a new key. Yeah, right, yeah. usually a higher key because obviously you can't capo lower. <laughs> usually a higher key, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you can't capo a piano. Not really. So, but you, you probably ought not have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, why wouldn't you have to? What, what are some things that, how do we, I guess we should just get into this process. You know? Yeah. Because we've already discussed the, um, I think we've gotten far enough in the harmonic discussion. Sure. With diatonic, uh, the diatonic uh, chords. Sure, yeah, yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think we have enough knowledge to go ahead and get into transposition. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of ways to do this. Or uh, it's really all kind of doing the same way, same thing, but there's a couple of ways to think about it. A couple of approaches. A couple of approaches. So one is by interval. And that's kind of what I did with my little C major melody, right? You know, um, those notes are C, G, E, D, C. Scale degrees 1, 5, 3, 2, 1. Right? So I'm going to transpose those all up a, um, all up a minor third. So C is going to go up a minor third to E flat. Mm -hmm. G is going to go up a minor third to B flat. I'm just using minor third as the for the sake of example. It could be any interval. Sure. Um, uh, e and D both going to go up a minor third to uh, G and F respectively, and then uh, and then we just have we just we end up playing the same thing. But we're now in E flat, so this is still scale degree one, five, three, two, one. Right, so the intervals maintain their integrity. In chromatic transposition. Which we'll focus on first. Yeah. This can be thought of as, as transposing up a minor third, 
It can be also thought of as transposing down a major six. Right. Those two are those two are equivalent. We'll end up if we transpose down a major six, we'll end up on the same notes, just an octave below. That's the E flat version, right? So, um, so yeah, uh, very important to know. Other thing we can do is uh, change the scale degree for each note of the old key for the scale degree of the new key. So um, let's just stick with our example. I'm in C major. And we've pointed out that this is scale degree one, five, three, two, one. So, I mean, and I want to play it in some other key for some, some other reason whatsoever. Pick a key, Jeremy. Oh, F sharp. Let's do F sharp. Uh, let F sharp, so. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, there we go. F sharp. So I'm just going to play those scale degrees in F sharp. F sharp, C sharp, A sharp, G sharp, F sharp. Scale degree one, five, three, two, one. Mm -hmm. And this is really just, this is still uh, transposing down by what would it have been a, a, a minor, an augmented fifth, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, still the same principle, just using scale degrees instead of interval. Yeah. And I'm proud of myself for playing an F sharp. There you go. Nice, man. Yeah. Um, also, if you change, uh, th this is sort of this is sort of funny. This is sort of the almost the dastardly you know, uh, sneaky way to do this. If you change a uh, clef on music that's written written out in a notation, you thereby change uh, the notes themselves uh, on, the, so, on the staff. On the staff, right? So, um, <clears throat> whereas if I was playing. C, G, E, D, C on a treble staff. Um, if I changed that to alto clef, mm. for example, I would end up playing... Right? Yeah. Was that a minor, though? Was that, that, a... that was a minor, because remember, uh, we've just changed the clefs. We haven't added any accidentals. Ah, uh, ha, ha, ha. Okay, yeah. Okay. So, so now the relationship to the to the uh, the thing is is changed. Yes, it has. Right. Um, the the integrity of the intervals have been compromised. Right. And this is this is an example of something called diatonic transposition, mm -hmm. where the where the key the the sharps and flats in your key remain remain sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. Like for example, in Baroque fugues, like you know Bach's uh, Little Fugue in G minor. Or um, I used to could play that. Um, right. And then, uh, uh. And then we're about to transpose. Uh. And then we're going to play that transpose to the fifth. Uh. That was not a direct intervallic transposition, right? That that's the or whatever it was, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you see that a lot, where the, where the key stays intact. Yeah. So to, with our uh, old example, if I was to and transpose that a diatonic major third up, um, you know. Hey, can we do something like maybe a little quicker and easier that people might recognize? Or sure. A little better. <clears throat> yeah. What if we did like Ode to Joy, just the first da 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 sure. da da, and in, in the key of G or whatever key you want to do it in. Okay. Yeah. So that key, that is originally in D major. Okay. So if I were to play Ode to Joy in D major. Uh huh. And if I was to transpose it to diatonic minor third up, you know, the notes uh, then would would be, um, you know, mm. 
Because, yeah, because the key was kept sacrosanct. And this changed the melody. And this changed the melody. I didn't quite recognize that as uh, Ode to Joy. Oh, uh, yeah. Rhythmically, uh, yes. Yeah, transposing Ode to Joy in minor third is kind of weird. I, sh I should have probably done it in the f by the fifth. Or, or what, uh, maybe just the second, like from A major to B, Dorian. Transpose up a second. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Difference. So that is diatonic. That is diatonic. Transposition. Where the key is remaining sacrosanct. Mm -hmm. Now, if I just want to play that, but in a different key, you're talking about a chromatic transposition. Right, right. right. That would be transposing it up to the key of E major. Mm hmm. Very good. Yeah. So, so far we've been discussing uh, transpositions with the melody specifically. Mm -hmm. So another part of that is going to be the harmonic content. Yes. So real quick, I'm going to kind of talk you through my process of how I uh, accomplished the Tuesdays Here, the opening track. All right. So first of all, I looked up the song Tuesdays Gone by Leonard Skinner. Uh -huh. And it starts off with an A. Yep. An E. Mm -hmm. F sharp. Nice. D. <laughs> and then back to A. So um, that, I had to sit there and at first of all, I had to say, okay, what are these chords? Yeah. I got an A. A. To E. To E. To F sharp, to B, uh, to D. One, five, six, four. So yes, I had to say, this is, a, and you can, once you get your ears good enough and sharp enough, you'll just hear it right off. All right. But I, you otherwise will have to go through the process of saying we're in the key of A. Yep. A is the one chord. Yeah. E is the five chord. Yeah. Six. Yep. Now, of course, that's, the, that's Tuesday's Gone, but I actually changed that D to a B minor <laughs> for my music, just so I'm not ripping off Leonard Skinner. And so that you're going around the circle of fists, one, five, six, two. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so um, then we decided that this was not a great key to play in. <sighs> so what I had to do was drop everything down to G, a, uh -huh. whole, a whole step from going down from A to G. Yeah. Yep. So now we still have a one. One. Five, five, six, four. Uh, yeah, four. Well, that yeah, of the original that would yeah, be a four. Yeah, yeah, a four. Uh, uh, it would have been an A minor of your modified version. So you're gonna hear the A minor on the recording, but uh, yeah. yeah, but that was the process I had to go on. So, and look how nicely that fell uh, into your hands on the guitar, having done that. Much better, Tran actually. Transposed to a to the key of G, which is a, a much more natural key on the guitar. It's very and friendly for people who are starting off on the basic chords, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, because a lot of those have open string notes, so you can just do first position chords on the guitar, and there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I guess... Uh, that's, the gist of, that's the gist of it, man. As long as you know what the chord... In, is, you put, forget anything about letters... Mm -hmm. This is not the key of C. This is this is just a key. Yeah. You know. So what am I hearing? I'm hearing a one, five, six, four progression. Yeah. Boom. And that's the way I would think about it too. Uh huh. Uh, being familiar with harmonic progressions as I am. Uh huh. Um, if you were, if you had a chord chart that were just letters, and you had to transpose just letters, <coughs> I would. You know, then you could you could think about the intervallic distance. Uh huh. You know, so if if you had you know the chords. Uh, C, G, D, A, and you wanted to transpose all of that up a perfect fourth. C would go up to F. Mm -hmm. yeah, G would go up to uh, G would go up to C. C. Yeah, F would go up to B flat, and A would go up to D. Right. Yeah. So it helps you to know your intervals because whatever you have to keep that interval true for all the chords and notes and. Cor correct. Correct. Uh, it it will help to know your intervals. Uh, it will really help to know your uh, chord functions and your scale degrees, you know. Um, remember that if you were transposing chords, you know, um, C uh, to transpose to transpose F major up to B flat and major means, you know, you're going to need that B flat in there so to, to keep it major, mm -hmm. right? you know. Uh, things like that will, will start to creep up. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so you better know something. <laughs> yeah. Well, by this point, if you're listening to this podcast in sequence, as we so recommend you as do. As we so recommend you do. You should know about intervals uh, and yeah. melody and harmony, right? Yeah, Diatonic right. chords. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this and, should be a breeze. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, you know, if you're looking at written sheet music, you know, just move it up to the notes you want and change the key to reflect that, and you're fine. Yeah. So I think, hopefully, from our discussion thus far, most musicians who will be using this for the reasons, for the practical reasons that a lot of people do, to accommodate their singers, to accommodate right. for maybe horn players who play in different uh, tunings. Right, yeah. Um, that, I think, can be accomplished yeah. so far. Yeah, yeah. It gets a little weird, though, doesn't it? It can get a little weird. It's about to get weird. It's about to get weird. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me start this off with a funny little story from my college uh, by my college years. Please do. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Clemens, my theory teacher, had us all arrange just a four-part piece. Um, we got to choose our instruments, mm-hmm. but I decided I didn't know a lot about horns, which became evident later on <laughs> because I decided to choose um, the French horn for one of my instruments. Uh uh-uh. and, the, and, the, and then one day we would all get together in class and we'd have musicians from the class play our compositions. Yeah. So I wrote something and I wrote it for the, this, horn, this horn part and Jason Kukendall, the uh, guy that was playing the horn, he got up to the point where... <laughs> I had written something a little too high for his instrument. <laughs> and when he got up to that note, he he couldn't play it, so he just... <laughs> just sang it? <laughs> he sang it. And I was like, why the hell did he do that? <laughs> and then afterwards, Dr. Clemens was like, well, you well, didn't that's... really have the horn in mind when you were writing this because you exceeded the register. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, so <laughs> I think if I had a better knowledge on that instrument, I might have uh, done a better job composing sure. for it. Yeah. So maybe we can spend a little bit of time talking about these transposing instruments. Right. So some instruments are actually transposing instruments, meaning that they sound a different note than what is written on the page. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> the reasons for this are historical in some, t- in some sense. So back before wind instruments had mechanical valves, they were kind of like a like the penny whistle or the bagpipes that we were talking about. You know, they could really sort of only play in one key. Mm-hmm. So uh, all of their parts were just written in C, and then they picked up the appropriate, uh, appropriately tuned instrument to to play in the key they wanted to play in. So they had like a utility belt with all these different whistles on them. And yeah, or are, are, like are these different different uh, clarinets, or you know, or are these different sized trumpets? You know, before trumpets had the actual valves, you know, you, they could. They could kind of only play in one or maybe two keys. And that may or may not have been historically accurate. Musicians back then may have not had utility belts. You may or may have not had utility belts. I'm just envisioning a belt with a whole bunch of clarinets. Yeah. (laughs) Strung around the... uh, Have a little clarinet kilt. A little clarinet skirt. A clarinet kilt. (laughs) Uh, that's, That's funny. Would have been a lot cooler if they did. Yeah, so and and it's sort of something that has stuck through the years. Even though now modern versions of these instruments have, uh, you know, mechanical, they have valves and mechanical keys and, and can play in, in any key whatsoever. They they are also uh, somewhat timbral. Mm-hmm. You know, people will say, you know, for example, a C trumpet is sounds a little bit brighter than a B flat trumpet. Mm-hmm. You know, so if if you want sort of the more mellowish tone of a B flat trumpet, you're going to need to know how to deal with that transposing in- instrument, and that's what that means, by the way, when you see something say trumpet in B-flat or clarinet in A, horn in F. What they mean is that we're, we're dealing with a transposing instrument hmm. uh, of some kind. And uh, so they can be, the reasons are historical, are somewhat timbral, uh, are, you know, a little bit f- more functional. You know, people uh, say that, you know, a, a clarinet in A is just easier f- to play sharp keys in, and you know, they just fall under your fingers a little better. Mm-hmm. You know? So, but, you know, you, if you're going to write for these instruments, you have to know how to deal with this. Because if you just write some music in, or even a chord chart or something, and just give it to a clarinet player, you know, they're going to be a whole step flat. Uh, you know? they and just play and nobody's going to know why, because they're going to say, well, I'm playing the notes you gave me. And, uh-huh. you know, so, so you need to know how to deal with this. So to make sure I understand this correctly, the composer himself or herself has to keep these transposing instruments in mind while they're while they're writing their piece. Yep. So he's writing 
Hmm. <laughs> Say it again, Matt. Uh, there is a written note and there is a sounding and note. A sounding note, okay. So, should I just go ahead and, and do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. See what you got. I, I, I tried to explain it. I did not do well. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, a B-flat clarinet. Uh-huh. What that B-flat means is that when the written note is C and okay. the clarinet player goes to play C. On his instrument. On his yes. instrument. The note that will come out is B-flat. Hmm. Uh, to put it succinctly, it sounds a major second lower than written. Hmm. And so that's the way you think of it. I like to just sort of think in my head, okay, written note, sounding note. And that's not just for the note C. That's for all the notes. They're yeah. going to sound a major second lower than what you wrote. Hmm. Uh, because C is going to be B flat. So if I'm writing notes for the clarinet, I want to write notes that are a major second above the notes that I want to actually play. Right. right? So that when he plays those notes, he'll he'll land on the right notes, which hmm. are a major second below that. Man. Yeah. So <clears throat> for the musician, it's no problem. They just play what they see. The musician just plays what he sees. Now, you know, musicians are not dumb. Uh -huh. You know, uh, clarinetists are aware of the fact that they, that they play a transposing instrument. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, uh, you don't want to really ask them to transpose in your head unless it's really, really simple or they're really, really good or they're really, really nice and you know they're not going to throw their clarinet at you. <laughs> Right, because that's, uh, and, a lot, that's a big mental exercise. It could be a little bit of a mental exercise. And, you know, like I said, they're not dumb. And, you know, a lot of clarinetists and, and trumpet players and what have you are also really good. And, and you know, it, it's possible that you'll be dealing with a clarinetist and say, well, I can transpose. Uh huh. But you don't want to ask them to do that if you can help it. It's right. much better to just give them the notes and say, play these notes and it'll come out right. Mm -hmm. This is what being a composer or arranger or a transcriber or what whatever this is this is kind of part of what your job is, right? To 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 get uh, to put on the page the notes that you need. The job that I did not do on that fateful day in my theory class. Where exactly. Jason Kukendall had to <laughs> sing that high note. Exactly. Well, uh, you know, the, the horns are a great example of something that uh, can be really difficult. So a horn in F uh -huh. transposes. Uh, it, it sounds a perfect fifth lower than written. Mm -hmm. Right, because if you play C, if you write C, that horn is going to be playing a perfect fifth lower than that. It's going to be playing F. Mm -hmm. Right, that's a pretty far way down. That's a long way to transpose. Mm -hmm. Right, um, so the horn can have a limited range, as you learned, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and that range is not as high as you think it might be. As you have learned, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if you, the horn really likes to play, you know, sort of in terms of the actual notes, what we call the sounding notes, the actual notes that are coming out, you know, they tend to like, you know, low notes, bass clefy notes going up around into, you know, maybe the bottom half of the treble clef. Okay. You know, so up, uh, up until about, uh, so... Um, you know, all, all good options. And then up to, you know, and good horn players can play much higher than that. But, you know, at this point, you have to stop to consider, you know, am I riding too high for the horn? Uh-huh. You know, if you, uh, if you wrote that, but you just wrote it in C, you know, um, uh, yeah, he's, he's going to be playing down here, right? Mm-hmm. You know? Um, and if you pl if you wrote up you know up here, then he's he's right around the edge of where it's really hard for him to play. Okay. Right. Yeah, as far as the organic, I guess the um, resonance of the instrument and the, yeah. uh, just the way it's kind of laid out. Yeah. His embouchure. Uh, yeah, uh, his embouchure, brass and wood instruments both, especially brass. It seems like to me, my personal opinion. Yeah, you know, there's just there's gray area. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not like um, it's not like some other instruments. You know, the piano can play up to here. Past that, I have no keys, right? Yeah. Um, with with uh, with the with brass, you know, it's sort of a question of well, how good is your brass player? 
you know, and what are you asking them to do? You know, higher notes are going to be louder, you know. Don't ask them to play high-pitched and soft. Okay. You know, they, that's not really something their instrument can do. Mm-hmm. You know, violinists can do that, no no problem. Guitar players can do that, no problem. But horn players and wind players can't always play loud, you know, cannot, can't always play a high pitch softly. Because it takes a certain amount of energy to produce certain notes. It takes a certain amount of air. Air. Yeah. And uh, pressure, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. Um, otherwise it falls off. Yeah, and some of this is more orchestration or anything. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so the horn in F, Sounds a, a a perfect fifth lower than written. Mm-hmm. So if you want, if you want middle C, for example, on a horn, you have to write that that G that is above the the G that is the the second line of the treble clef, mm-hmm. right? And, and so and then he'll play C. You know, you have to write something other than what you think you're gonna hear. I guess. Exactly. Yeah. And. I uh, should have mentioned this before, but another reason for a lot of these transpositions is because because it's really hard to write for an instrument like that that's sort of between clefs. You know, you, you transpose it up, and then you can write in treble clef. Uh-huh. You know, you can just write in treble clef all the time, and and that's easy. You, they're not av- being asked to read a lot of ledger lines and things. You just have to know what you're doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is kind of your job if you're a composer or an arranger or something like that. You know. A... A horn in F sounds a perfect fifth lower than written. An E flat clarinet or an E flat alto saxophone or something like that plays a major sixth lower. So if I write C, you know what they're go- what they're going to play is actually that note there. Mm-hmm. Uh, e flat. E flat. Right. Major right. sixth lower. Okay. Right? That's really tough, you know. That, that that's a that's a kind of a messed up interval to have to transpose down by. But you can do it, you mm-hmm. know. Just write everything, you know. Um, if I want them to play, uh, if I want them to play the note G, I have to think about what's a major six above G. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And and write E. Mm. Yeah. And some of this is just is just knowing, you know, uh, knowing what you're writing for. Shall I prattle out a quick list of the transposing instruments that I have here? Yes. Because uh, there's more than I thought there were. There are a lot. Yeah, no kidding. Okay, so let's just take it from the top. Like you said, we got the English horn in F, right? In F. Perfect. And, lower. you know, neither English nor horn, but it is an F instrument. So it sounds a perfect fifth lower, just like the horn. So, so there's like three categories. There's, there's the instrument, there's the sound with respect to notation. Yes. And then there's the transposition needed to notate. In other words, the instrument, the sounding note, and the written note. Yep. So... And the horn, in the case of the F horn, the uh, the uh, sound with respect to notation is a perfect fifth lower. Transposition needed to notate is a perfect fifth up. So I guess that just they complement. That is that. a theory textbook way of saying what we just said. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, then let me not worry about that. Great, <laughs> all that all that other stuff. I'm just going to go through the instruments. Okay. Good plan. <laughs> so we got the English horn and F. English horn is an F instrument, just like the horn. Perfect fifth lower. Clarinet. We have three. Mm-hmm. There is a B flat clarinet. Major second low sounds major second lower than written. An A clarinet. Sounds a minor third lower than written. And then an E flat clarinet. Sounds a major sixth lower than written. Yep. Minor three higher, major six lower. Same difference. Mm-hmm. Bass clarinet in B flat. I guess that's plus an octave. That is actually a major ninth lower. Very good, very good. Because it, it gets down there in, in the bass clef. And it's really a bass instrument, even though when you, you, you write for it, you're writing it as a treble instrument. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's nutty. That is that is nutty. <laughs> so that's the clarinets. Now we shall move on to the saxophones. Mm-hmm. Because I was often um, out here, soprano sax, alto sax. Yeah, yeah. But I never exactly knew what, what they, and here we go, here we yeah. go. So the soprano saxophone is in B flat. Right. Uh, major second lower. Yeah, nice and easy, just like a lot of things. Alto saxophone, E flat. E flat, that's that major six, just like the E flat clarinet. Yep. Uh, tenor saxophone, B flat. Yes, B flat, but an octave, right? Oh uh, yeah, B flat plus an octave. Mm, B flat, yeah. So major second plus an octave, major otherwise second. known as a as a major ninth. Yeah, baritone saxophone, also E flat, just like the alto saxophone. Mm-hmm. But is that one also plus an octave? It is. Yeah, it is. So major six plus an octave. That's actually pretty low. Yeah. Which is baritone, I guess. That's Which what... is baritone, yeah. Still writing in treble clef. 
Um, and then we talked about the English horn earlier, but now we're going to talk about the other horns. Yeah. Are these all French horns or what? Or coronets or what? Are, what are these? If, just... they're, if, if you call them horns, then they're referring to French horns. Okay. Okay. So we got the horn and F as yep. we. Yeah. The most common. The most common. Okay. Mm. F for French. F for French. There That's one way to remember that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> e flat. Mm-hmm. The horn, E flat horn. These are all the same recipes. Yeah, major right? six lower. Yeah, anything that's called E flat, major six lower. Mm-hmm. And then an E. There's an E horn. Yeah, probably more comfortably can play in sharp keys. I would imagine. Sharp keys, eh? Sharp keys, because E major is a sharp key. Yes, you are right. All that work paid off, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I knew something. Yeah. And then finally, there's a D horn. Right, which is actually a major second higher, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. And then that brings us to the trumpet. Yes. There's only two of those. There is B flat and there is D. Yeah. And there is also a C trumpet. But we'll get into that in just a second. Oh, cool. Cool. Well, these are all these are all brass and wood. And most of your transposing instruments. These are all brass. Oh, clarinet. Clarinets are woodwinds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, these are, are um, most... Wind instruments are most typically what transposes. So woodwinds and brass. Hmm. Yeah. Is that me or you? That's probably me. <laughs> Skipped lunch. Oh, uh, yeah. You got to get some food in your belly, man. <laughs> well, we don't have too much more to go. I mean, we're kind of reaching, yeah. reaching the end of we're all this. We're getting towards the end here. Um, and my stomach is doing it too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be like whale song in the background. <laughs> the hungry podcasters. <laughs> okay. So there's a list of the transposing instruments. Is there anything else we should cover regarding those? You'll, you'll be happy to know that not all instruments transpose, Yeah. as you've probably surmised. Yeah. All the ones I don't play? <laughs> right. I mean, all the ones I do play. All the ones you do play yeah. are non... What, this is what we call C instruments, meaning they play the note that is written. If you write C, it will sound C. Mm. Uh, beautifully simple, right? Yeah. So these are all the strings... Yeah. Uh, violin, viola, cello, bass, uh, guitar, you know, mandolin, banjo. These uh, all almost anything with a string on it is a C instrument. Piano obviously is a C instrument. Um, flutes and oboes and bassoons are C instruments. Uh, bass, brass instruments like trombones are C instruments. Hmm. Uh, tuba yeah. is a C instrument. You know, and all of their uh, that's all of their uh, uh, um, uh, variations to the tenor trombone and the bass trombone and the tuba and the euphonium. You know, all C instruments. Anything that plays in bass clef is going to be a C instrument. <laughs> okay. You know, um, timpani or C instruments, for what, for what that's worth. Ah. Uh, yeah. So uh, by C instrument, that means play exactly the note that's written. Play the non-transposing. Right. You you read it, you play it. You read it, you play it. Now, there are a couple of little tiny, not hard to get your brain around caveats with that. Uh, there are C instruments that play the, the that are technically transposing instruments and that the, they play an octave below what is written, such as the contrabass. Okay. Uh, the the stand-up bass. You will be playing notes in the bass clef playing along, and the notes you are actually playing are an octave below that. That is what the term contra means. Oh. Yeah. Cool, mm-hmm. cool. Yeah, yeah. It, mean, it means beneath. And they would, uh, back in back in the early Baroque, when these instruments were first coming into prominence, they would just give the same part to the cellists and the, bass, and the bassists. The bassists would just be playing the same part, but because of their instrument, it would be below. Okay. It would be an octave below. Yeah, still the same note, just an octave below. Uh, the guitar actually plays an octave below. Hmm. Yeah, interesting, huh? That is interesting. Yeah. Um, there are some instruments uh, that play an octave above. For example, the piccolo Okay. Uh, plays an octave above the note written. So again, you know, you can just give a flute part to a piccolo player, and they would play the same part, but because they're on a piccolo, they're playing it an octave above. And the piccolo is the highest registered instrument. Yes. Is it not? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, so there's that. So far, so good. So, okay, Jeremy, how about this? Let's let's test your knowledge now. Uh oh. I'm writing for B flat trumpet. Okay. And I ha- and I have written the note. Uh, I have written the note F sharp. 
Okay. Although, you know, my trumpet player would kill me. Let's say I've written this note F sharp. Okay. That sounds like a good trumpet part, right? Yeah. So I've written this F sharp. If I've written this F sharp, what note is really sounding? So the sound is actually going to be in a B flat instrument, um, um, a major second lower. So. So what was that note you played? A B F sharp. F sharp. So it's actually going to be. We're going to hear an E. You're going to hear an E. Okay. Yeah. So you just. So what I guess I might have missed this whole time, which makes it a little bit easier now that I think about it, you just relate everything to C. Yeah. If you're playing a B-flat instrument, mm -hmm. because B-flat is a major second lower than C, mm -hmm. you're just going to do... This sounding is a second lower than than written. So we're going to use C kind of as our root or pivot or our uh, pivot point or yeah, whatever yeah. you want to call it. Um, here's another little challenging question. Reference point. Yeah, a reference point, yeah. Here's another challenging little question. If I have this A, f if I'm on a horn in F, okay, and I want them to play the note A flat, this is the note I want to hear. Uh huh. What note should I write on the music? So you want the horn itself to play an actual true A flat, A flat note. Mm -hmm. So you'll have to notate mm -hmm. a note that is actually a fifth, a fourth low, a fifth up, a fifth up, a fifth higher. Right? Because it plays a fifth lower than written. Uh huh. So if I want this, then I'm going to write the note that's a fifth higher, which will be E flat. E flat. Yeah. I don't know why I played it, but you know, yeah. <laughs> and that's the easiest thing to do is to kind of go in the wrong direction. Uh huh. You know, but just remember sounding written. Uh huh. You know, um, the if the sounding note is a fifth lower, then to get that note, I have to write a fifth higher. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Transposition. Transposition. What else can we say? I felt like I had something else to say about that. <laughs> oh, oh, you said something. You, you said that you were going to say more about the C horn. Oh, the C trumpet? The C trumpet, yeah. There's just such a thing as a C trumpet, and it's just a C <laughs> instrument. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So there you go. That's it. It's another C <laughs> instrument, so you can actually play the trumpet like you read it. Yeah, if you have a C trumpet. C trumpet, yeah. Yeah. Is that a, is that a common thing, or is that fairly uncommon? When did the C trumpet come in? Moderately common. <clears throat> I guess they 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 see they tend to sound brighter than B flat trumpets. Right. So one cuts a little more. Yeah. One's a little darker. I yeah. Put in quote, yeah. Quotation more. Uh, yeah. Quotation more. Great man. Well, transposition has been something that I don't think that I could have lived without as a musician. Sure. Yeah. Um, and the knowledge of how to do so. Mm -hmm. has been a game changer for me throughout my life and with my career as a musician. You're going to need it. You're going to need it. You can't You can mm -hmm. not do it. At some point in your career, you're going to need it because you're going to be with a singer who wants to play something lower or, you know, you're going to be playing with some instrument like a clarinet and, you know, you're going to need to be in sync with them and, you know, and, you know, clarinetists, professional clarinetists are very bright. Mm -hmm. They understand that their their instrument is a transposing instrument. We don't always play with professionals, you know. No. Uh, sometimes people who play clarinet in high school band or something, you know, they don't always get the uh, they don't always get the the uh, thorough education in in this kind of stuff and the differences. And they 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 can be like, well, I'm playing the notes you wrote, what, and, and not even know what's wrong. Yeah, that kind of brings me back to the discussion we had with Carlos Pino, uh, the guitar episode that we did recently, about how um, you kind of want to surround yourself with musicians who have more musical knowledge than you. Yeah. Right? And if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yeah. <laughs> well put. Well put. Um, well, you got to get out of here, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep you out of my face. No, basement. no. I, I don't think so. Uh, I'm, I'm the guy who does this kind of crap the most. That yeah, doesn't right. make me this smart. Repetition. But, yeah. Well, on that, on that note, I think this could be a good thing for you, our students, to challenge yourselves with. Say, mm. find one of your favorite pop songs that you already know. Mm hmm You already know all the chords. Yep. Try transposing it to something. Try transposing it to some new key and see how you do. And don't just stick a capo on your guitar. Nope, that's cheating. That's cheating. You know, uh, actually transpose uh, to, to some new key. It's a great little exercise. And if you're doing something in the key of G, yeah, you can transpose it to C. Yeah, you can transpose it to D. But hey, why don't you challenge yourself a little bit? 
Transpose it to A flat. A flat, E flat. Yeah. Something crazy and weird like that. Something mm. you're not comfortable or familiar with. Yeah. Transpose it to B. B sucks on a guitar. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> man, that, uh, that B7 chord is... Ooh, man. It's crumbly. I hate that thing. It's too crowded. <laughs> too crowded. But yeah, that's a great way to get to know transposition better because it's something you're going to need to know better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whoa. That was a little bumpy on reentry. This is uh, still past Jeremy as far as you listeners are concerned. However, this is future Jeremy relative to when the podcast itself was recorded. The reason I'm doing this is because I was reviewing the episode and I thought back to a friend of ours, Jonathan Naylor, who said that the recaps of these episodes were some of his uh, most useful parts. Uh, Just to kind of solidify everything. Uh, And it helps me too, myself personally. So for the sake of myself, you listeners, and our good friend Jonathan Naylor, I've decided to climb into my editing time machine and risk breaking the rules of space-time continuum and the butterfly effect, and I'm going to try and make things right. So we talked about transposition. This is the act of basically moving a group of notes up or down while keeping the same intervals uh, between the notes. Now, one of the more common types or practical kinds of transposition would be chromatic. We discussed that pretty well at length. Um, Each note, in this case, each note moves up or down while keeping all the intervals true in between the notes. So effectively, you're hearing the exact same melody, only you're moving it to a different key. It'll sound the exact same, it'll be at a different key. So that'll probably require changing some accidentals. The other type of transposition we discussed was diatonic. Now in this case, you're actually playing the same melody, but because you're not changing keys, the intervals between the notes might vary a little bit. And it's going to sound similar to the melody, but it's going to be a little bit different. So if you're playing a melody that starts uh, on scale degree 1 in a major key, for example, and you take that exact same melodic structure and start it with um, scale degree 2 from that same key, well, it's going to have a Dorian feel. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take on the feel of whatever mode the new melody is based on, but it'll all be the same key signature. Same number of sharps for flats, right? This kind of transposition often occurred in uh, some of the classical compositions where the composers would... Um, try and vary a theme that they create, change it up a little bit to uh, progress the movement of a piece that they've composed. Now, when and why would we use transposition? Well, sometimes uh, a group of people might get together to play some music, a band or whatever, and uh, maybe the original piece of music or the key that all the rest of the band knows it in might be too high or too low for the singer to sing it in, in which case they'll need to transpose it down or up respectively. Uh, In other instances, some instruments sound better or feel better or have more richness when they're played with open strings. So maybe a guitarist might want to hear something in G that was originally done in F-sharp. You know, sometimes the key of F-sharp requires playing bar chords, which aren't always as rich or resonant as open string, uh, playing more open string chords. Myself a bassist, case in point, I love songs that are in the key of E because I get to hit that low note that I really love to feel, you know? Uh, Speaking of transposing keys of songs, we kind of played a little bit of an example how I used Tuesday is Gone by Leonard Skinner uh, as an example. And um, I found that the song was originally, the first four chords were A, E, F sharp minor, and D. Well, I used my theory brain to figure out that those were actually chords 1, 5, 6, and 4. So all I needed to do to drop it down to G was relate those diatonic chords to the key of G. So I had then G1, D5, E minor 6, and C4. Of course, in the case of my little uh, representation of the song, I used A minor to replace uh, C. The relative minor, that is. Moving on, there's also shortcuts where people can use capos on certain stringed instruments, uh, like the banjo and so forth. But in most other instruments, you're just going to have to figure out how to transpose, you know? Some software offers shortcuts. You know, I think Sibelius even has a transpose button. You just click it once, you know. But that's no fun. One other thing past Jeremy had wished he had mentioned was uh, reading notation. When you're reading notation, if you can get used to actually thinking of intervals between the notes instead of actually assigning names to them, so C, E, G becomes 1, 3, 5, for example, you'll kind of get used to the patterns and the way they look, and then I think that'll also aid greatly in transposing on the fly, specifically when you're reading uh, notation. And we also talked about instruments that transpose, transposing instruments. Um, 
these are instruments that actually sound differently than the notes that are written so that the composer has to keep that in mind while composing the pieces with these instruments. A lesson I learned early on. A lot of these instruments are keyed in E flats, B flats, and Fs, you know, different things like that. And they're often brass and woodwind instruments, uh, instruments I think that are more difficult to adjust uh, compared to the instruments you can tune and, and so forth. Um, and then we discussed there's actually C instruments, which in which case the note sounds exactly as it's played. So if you're playing a C instrument, you play a C note, it'll sound as a C note. We also kind of went through a quick list of all the transposing instruments uh, in the orchestra, for example, and uh, that was a good little little chat. What all they do and what, what's really going on when you're playing these instruments or writing for these instruments. And then Matt finally put my theory brain to work and gave me a few little challenges on how I might handle transposing, writing for transposing instruments, and uh, that was, of course, good times. Uh, and also, I think, uh, again, it's great for you guys to consider challenging yourselves by transposing a song you're familiar with. Not to another key that you're familiar with, but maybe a key you're not at all comfortable with. See how it goes. Let us know. Anyways, my job here is done. I will now turn you over back to past Matt and past Jeremy, and I will step back into my editing time machine. So I, I think that pretty much covers it. Any questions, always talk to us. Info at Music Student 101. We've really appreciated your feedback, and it's really been great to hear your stories, your success stories, and your challenges. We'd love to be able to help you out with those kind of things. Yeah. <laughs> and if, there, if there's anything, you know, I'm fully aware of the fact that I don't always describe things exactly as, as absolutely clearly as possible. So if there's anything that's unclear... Email us. We'll be glad to discuss it further. You know, you'd be surprised at how responsive we can be to the Facebook. Uh, if you just post yeah. a question on the Facebook page, one of us is going to come in it there and, and answer it. Yeah, one of us is going to come in there and answer it. Absolutely. Speaking of social media, as long as we've been doing this, I think we have 170 Facebook likes. <laughs> uh, spread the word out there. Yeah. Uh, help us out. Uh, like us on Facebook. That seems to be the way to get, get, get our stuff You across. guys like us, right? You so, like us. So like us on Facebook. Please like us. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and uh, do that, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll respond forthwith. Yes. And uh, you know, send us a message for a private discussion or put it up on the feed for a group discussion. Absolutely. It'll be fun. So we'll see you on Facebook. Yeah, hopefully. Until next time, see you soon. And there you go. Another mystery unraveled. If you have any stories or experiences with transposition, please share them with us. And info at musicstudent101.com All right, I'm about to miss the end of this song. Until next time. 